So hi, everyone, and welcome to day two of our Students and Careers Resource Symposium hosted by the ESA Student Services and the ESA Student Section. And ESA stands for the Ecological Society of America. And today we're reading, kind of, the first session is going to focus on life as a science communicator. And we have two incredible science communicators with us today. We're going to talk a little bit about how they communicate their science on a social media platform and why they're doing what they do. So um, the first person I would like to introduce, uh, well, never mind, I should come to that slide. So our first speaker is going to be Eli Myron. Um, Eli, if you don't mind like giving like a one minute hash introduction about who you are. Yeah. Um, so my name's Eli and I just recently graduated from Florida State um, this past spring. I studied marine biology with um, majors in biology and environment and society. And I have been in a really interesting position this past year. I received a Fulbright in April and it was supposed to start this past August and it just keeps getting moved when the, the start date is happening. So I've gotten really into science communication on YouTube in this little um, gap that I have. All right, I know Eli's YouTube channel is pretty great. Um, <laughs> All right, so next we'll have Dr. Fernando Garcia Bastidas. Am I saying that right? Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, would you mind talking, just telling us a little bit about yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Fernando. I'm from Colombia. Um, I'm a researcher uh, working in plant health and plant breeding for maybe 15 years or something. Um, along with this um, professional career, I also started to do some sci communica science communication a long time ago. And I'm, I will, you will see this in the presentation, but uh, I decided to change my strategy. And it turned out that it's working very well. So I have a lot of followers and, and my way to do it is a little bit different, but uh, at the end it goes to the same purpose, so communicate science and make it in a nice uh, and funny way. Yeah, and I also know about your digital art because I recently got my caricature from you. So you've been doing some yeah. incredible work. So thank you so much for both of you for joining us today. And we will start with Eli. If you have slides to share, I just made you co-host so you should be able to share. I'm gonna stop sharing yeah. so that you can go ahead and share your screen. All right, so I just prepared a little rough outline of a presentation, but um, so I'll just kind of use it as a foundation for what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to talk about how you can actually use YouTube, which I feel like is a pretty underutilized resource for scientists in general and something that has a whole lot of untapped potential that I've recently discovered um, as someone in science and just as a person in general. But um, going back to um, where my interest in all of this lies. I grew up with a lot of interest in different kinds of arts and um, creative fields like photography and like 2D arts. And a lot of these subjects of my art were always animals and the environment. And I just absolutely, that was what I was always drawn to. So I had this huge passion for um, creative endeavors and all kinds of things that were um, kind of related to life sciences. And so in middle school, I was actually known as the reptile guy. I had so many reptiles. I had um, up to four snakes and four lizards and a lot of other animals at one point. And this over here on the right is me standing next to my eight foot cage of um, iguanas boa constrictors, and there's a big tegu lizard on the bottom. <laughs> um, my interest in marine biology comes from a lot of my um, years growing up visiting the Florida Keys when I was younger and getting to dive and snorkel on the beautiful um, coral reefs of the Florida Keys. So um, during college, I was very fortunate to be able to do a lot of different types of experiences. And this was just a few examples of them and the first one here on the left was um, a veterinary internship and then I went to Honduras to work with a nonprofit um, working with coral reefs and working with um, the local communities there and getting to do a lot of outreach 
I also was able to participate in a lot of research at Florida State with sharks, and I was able to do an honors thesis as well. And this is what really encouraged me to continue pursuing um, marine biology and become a marine biologist one day. But the big thing that I really wanted to incorporate in a future career that didn't seem to like really exist in a lot of these other professions is this really um, creative aspect of documenting things and turning the things that I see and the things that I experience into a form of art. I believe that art is one of the most powerful ways that you can influence the world. And I have found that um, through social media, you can make all kinds of exciting types of art that reach a lot of people and very large audiences. So why is YouTube this fantastic platform that I'm just going to continue to blow up? So YouTube is actually the second largest search engine in the world. So Google is, of course, the first. But YouTube actually is a really unique um, social media in that it's not exactly a social media. It's more of a search engine than anything. And so because of that, the content that you put out can be searchable and very easy to find for many years down the road. And so if you're in science, this is really beneficial if you are trying to find people within your niche or you're trying to find any kind of um, research techniques or anything that um, you're really interested in related to your field. You can't really do that on other types of social media. It's more um, kind of person-based or whatever kind of falls into your um, feed. And the other really cool thing about YouTube that doesn't happen on any other platform that I know of is that once you reach 1,000 subscribers and you also need 4,000 watch hours, you actually get paid. This is just, it just happens. You just, um, once you get 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours, you apply and you get accepted to the YouTube Partner Program. And for the rest of your life, for the rest of time that these videos are online, you will get paid for people to watch them. And so this is a really um, kind of like no brainer reason of why you should start YouTube if you haven't already, just because if, if you even just post one video, you could actually make money on it um, down the road and for a very long period of time. Um, and another thing, if you really become dedicated to YouTube is that once you have a dedicated fan base and you have a following base and you have a decent amount of subscribers, then you will have sponsors approach you to pay you up to $1,000 to $30,000 per video to basically partner with you and have them have you say about 30 seconds to a minute um, shouting out whatever company company it is and if it's a company that really relates to your science and your research this can be really helpful for not only your own research but also um, people that are watching and can really benefit from whatever it is one um, sponsorship that um, has been really helpful for me I, I don't have any sponsors yet but from a uh, um, a YouTuber that I follow, he is often sponsored by Notion. And because he's sponsored by Notion, he talks about Notion a lot. It's this really incredible note-taking um, like online server or service. And now I have this useful resource. I know about this useful resource from his sponsorship. Um, so more reasons why YouTube is desirable in science. More people are paying attention to what you're doing as a scientist, what um, you're doing within your field, and also about your science. Um, you're also, something that I think a lot of people don't really think about as a scientist, but you kind of become a, a little bit of an entrepreneur. You have to fight to get funding. You have to fight to get um, your research noticed and it's all kind of up to you. You're, you're your own boss and unless you're functioning with a very established team of scientists, you really have to um, fight for your own funding. And so once you build a dedicated following of um, people on your YouTube channel, you can have actual business opportunities to collaborate with other scientists, to collaborate with other types of um, sponsors that may benefit you and your field. Um, 
And so an example of this that you might be familiar with, and I'm just checking the time, how much time I have right now. Um, so an example of a business opportunity that's pretty common in science is launching some kind of course that talks about your um, research methodology or something that you, um, something to educate people on that you're very experienced with. Um, there's a lot of webinars that pop up that you have to pay for to enter. You can end up forming some collaborations from people that find your um, YouTube channel and you already will have a dedicated fan base, dedicated following of people that are going to be more willing to buy it. Um, and then the other really great thing about YouTube is that you can reach millions of people and positively impact the world um, from a very searchable um, engine. So life as a science communicator, um, was, it's really interesting. I Once I got Fulbright and I was in this really interesting situation to where I uh, was kind of stuck um, like employment wise because I had, I graduated in May, I was supposed to leave in January for my Fulbright. So it was really difficult to kind of find a research type position with such short notice and such a undetermined timeline. So I was really fortunate to, to be able to just come home and live with my parents and have this opportunity to really explore and dive into being a full-time YouTuber. So I actually took this on and was a full-time YouTuber for about four to five months. And what that kind of looked like, sorry for these very non-engaging slides, but what that kind of looked like was I would take a full day of writing scripts and then I would have a full day of filming a video and then I would have a full day of editing these videos and making sure that the thumbnail was good and that I had a um, good keywords to make sure that it was gonna be found. And so I guess some, before I move on to this next part, but I guess a really big thing I wanna touch on is that you, you don't have to be a full-time YouTuber for it to be really beneficial and for you to have these great benefits that I'm talking about. Um, I was able to do this and kind of blow my channel up a lot faster. I mean, only at about a thousand subscribers now, but I was able to take it to a much higher level much faster because I was doing it full time, but you could easily do um, one video a month, one video every other month or whenever you can and still get a lot of benefits out of it. So some future plans and why I am again, really interested in diving into YouTube is because I see this as an investment for my future for as a scientist, because I'm forever going to have these videos of people um, that people can find and people can benefit from. And I am going to eventually make money with this um, platform as I hit a thousand subscribers and as people continue watching it over time. I also wanted to mention that I only have about 900 subscribers now, but I've already had, I have people reaching out to me almost every day now, <laughs> either through comments or through direct emails about people that either want to collaborate or be my mentee or want to do a video together. So even with a very few followers, I'm getting this, these kinds of opportunities already popping up. Um, so yeah, that is my presentation. I was that was actually that didn't seem like a draft presentation at all. That was a really good presentation, and uh, yeah, like you mentioned, you're reaching like as scientists, we're really, really reaching niche groups, like very small groups that focus on the work that we're directly aligned with. So you know, 900 followers is really not a small thing when it comes to an academic community. So yeah. it's really nice to hear that different perspective, kind of how you can make money out of it. I did not know all these. That you can do all of these with YouTube. Um, well, I'm probably never going to be on YouTube, but you know, it's nice to hear another perspective and a person who's been doing some great videos. Like, I have watched so many of your videos and they're so informative. So, I'm really glad you had the opportunity to share this today. And, um, Eli, so you can stop sharing your screen. Um, and then, Fernando, you can go ahead and start sharing yours. So, again, thank you very much for this opportunity with this presentation. I'm going to 
share a little bit of my very, very personal experience as science communicator. Um, I will start with this slide, uh, but actually I decided to change a little bit the title because believe it or not, I'm a very shy person. I'm an introvert um, scientist, and this actually helped me to, to go fast, faster and better with my skills behind the computer. So as Ellie mentioned, um, the platforms of social media are very powerful for us as a scientist. So um, in this presentation, as I mentioned, I'm going to show you essentially what I've been doing for the last years. I actually started very early, but you will see that later. And the thing here is that I'm going to talk also about what is a digital content creator and what is a science communicator because are two different things, but that doesn't exclude the one to be the other one. But you have to be clever and, and take care and be careful also with these kind of, of uh, situations here. So I'm gonna talk about my path, the strategy that I'm using that is actually using humor, using art, but also with serious topics, using social media, what I'm doing now and what are my plans for the future. As you can see here in the right corner, I'm going to put some tips for you that you can use to increase your numbers of followers. Um, if, of course, if you are interested on that, time is not very long, so I will probably not st stop too much in that, but just for you to know. So I'm a science communicator. Well, I think I am because I'm doing a lot of science communication, but. I consider myself as a content digital creator, what is known as a kind of influencer for most of you. So my name is Fernando and people know me as Banana Man, essentially because my topic of research are bananas and Panama disease. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doing science communication, but I'm also a scientist myself. So I did a master, a PhD actually, Currently, I'm finishing a second postdoc and becoming a time, uh, a full-time researcher. So to start with, I would like to make this difference. According to the definitions that I found in the internet, a science communicator has the role of informing, educating, raising awareness of science-related topics, increasing the sense of wonder about scientific discoveries and arguments. While the digital creator essentially is responsible as the word indicates to create. It's a creative person who creates material dedicated to a specific um, digital media and also to different um, uh, audiences. So both are very similar, but the thing is that the science communicators have a more focused audience and are dedicated only to science. In my case, I'm doing science communication, but I'm also doing other kind of things that you will see there. So let's go a little bit to the past. I'm not that old, but actually when I started, I started at the same time as YouTube was created. At that time, I was a, already a scientist, but I, I used social media for a totally different thing. So as you can see here, I had a small business of action figures and what I did was just reviews of figures and I got a lot of, of followers and actually as Ellie mentioned before it was even easier to make money on YouTube you didn't need a thousand or you didn't need the four thousand views you can just put a video and if people like it and see it you start earning money I made at that time more or less twenty five dollars per month which per week which was a lot in Colombia so it was a good business for me. Uh, I also use my skills for another content like insects and drawings. But because I was a scientist, I also used Twitter that at that time was like the platform to use Twitter to communicate science. Still happened, but in the past, I'm talking like I'm very old, but some years ago, Twitter was completely different than it is now. And these kind of things, even though you, you can still see these kind of things on, you, on, on Twitter, but this was the kind of science communication that was done before. It was this kind of graphs that only are understandable by scientists, right? 
for, and even for scientists in different fields is very complex to understand. And this was the type of science communication that was happening before. For X, X or Y reasons, I stopped that uh, work for many years and I went to a dark time. But then there is a, a, a time that I call the Renaissance and was when I started my PhD and I came to the Netherlands. So I came to Bakken University. I had a very busy PhD life, but it, I noticed that science communication was more appreciated in this country and it actually encouraged. So I was still making some videos and nice pictures and the people from communication in my group contacted me to help them to, with pictures, with videos. But then they were making the same mistakes again, very boring communication about our work. And then I took a decision and that was to focus on one audience. And for me, that was what changed everything. So I decided that I would do science communication for people without a scientific background. So very simple science, but very, at the same time, very serious. I really like this meme because it's very, it's very true. So people love memes, love humor, and we can actually bring science camouflage it in, in something like this. So what you, you need is somebody who's encouraged to do it. So that's what I started to do. And here another tip, choose very well your niche because that will define you as a science communicator. Can you change later your, your strategy? Yes, you can, but once you start, I said by experience, it's very difficult to modify later your strategy. So I decided to go for the general public and that's what I've been doing all this time. Remember this slide? I already knew the mistakes and I didn't want to do this again. But why if I mix? So I decided to mix my skills on, on videos on YouTube, um, pictures, drawings, and combine with science. And that's what I started to do. I made a lot of artistic, let's say artistic, because I don't consider myself an artist, but at least I use artistic expressions to communicate science. And I started to make videos. I started to use my drawings, nice pictures, and communicate science in a different way. Here are my other tip. So be fun, visual, because you know, one picture says more than a thousand words. Be interactive. So always challenge the people, ask questions, uh, start games. These kind of things makes you to grow in numbers. And that's important because at least as a content creators or science communicator, uh, as Ellie mentioned, we need more people that encourage us to, to make more. So if you feel that people are receiving these kind of, of messages, you can, you are, um, how do you say, like, like more motivated to continue. And that worked very well because a lot of attention was uh, received from our group in the, in the banana. We, we got visitors from everywhere, uh, journalists. And of course, I'm also a good scientist. So I published papers and my papers, papers were very good at that time. And also I was in the TV, as you can see here, and also in National Geographic ones. So I started to grow very fast in numbers. And this is very true. The great power comes with great responsibility. So I started to have a voice and that's important that we do a good science communication with good basis. So you have to become an expert in your field. And if you don't know, it's better that you contact the person who knows to do this kind of communication. So we decided to start different events, like for example, the Wageningen, for those that are not familiar, is the name of the university. Uh, we started the Wageningen Banana Day, and we organized many events in which we focus on people without scientific background, but also in the little ones, as you can see here, and teaching about bananas, about diseases in plants, using games. And then remember this uh, banana that I made, this one? So I decided that that would be a nice opportunity for me. But then I discovered Instagram. And Instagram, is it has a really endless possibilities for science communication and for art. So I wanted to make art with bananas, but then uh, this is another bad thing of Instagram that when you think you invented something, probably somebody else already did it. So you have to really be creative. 
So when I tried to do that, I noticed that there was a very famous artist already working with that. Um, then what I did was to contact him. I, I invite him to work with me in a project that I call science plus science, uh, science plus art. In this case, I invited academics to talk about bananas, but I also invited artists who work with bananas. Just imagine if I make this event only for academics, the audience will be little. But if, but because I invited a famous artist, this was seen by many, many more people and more people got involved in this project. So the next tip, tip for you is collaboration. There is not a way that you can be successful without collaboration in social media. So collaborate with other science communicators and don't limit yourself to this. If you want numbers, you have to collaborate with artists. They have bigger audience with journalists, with food lovers, with everyone. Some, a few years ago, I started, I started something that I call Insta Friends. So I meet my followers and I gave them the opportunity to show what they are doing, their research, their art, wherever they have to show. And that was also very good for them to grow in numbers, but also to you because you are going to be seen by the followers of that people. And then the possibilities some are very big. As you can see, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of things that are, I'm getting from these people. What are the advantages? Broader visibility, because if you focus only in the academia, is the, the niche here, the community is very little if we compare with another niche. So you have visibility for yourself. You put yourself in the map. The, you can share your knowledge and learn. You can also, as Ellie mentioned, uh, business opportunities. And as a good influencer, you can also get a lot of things for free. So that's also nice, right? Then the university noticed that I was doing a good job with this. And I, at some point, I had more followers than the university. And then I, did, I was offered to work with them to prepare blogs. But that was really difficult for me because as I mentioned before, I'm very shy. I'm not good at acting in front of a camera when somebody else is filming. The good thing with the blogs is that you can do it yourself. So I made several videos in which I, of course, show my own work with bananas, but I invited very serious professors from the university to fund videos. I put them to dance even, and they were just happy because these kind of things are good for them because they, if they are going to apply for grants or something, they need to be known in the world. What's the best way? YouTube, as, as it was mentioned before. So currently I have a community of more or less 18 to 20,000 followers if I combine all my, my possibilities. And the most interesting part is that the followers I have in each of these different accounts are completely different. So that's a very nice combination to work. For example, in, in Twitter, mostly I work with academics, but in Instagram is mostly artists. Uh, my other tip here is don't neglect your job or your study. So if you have a job, take care of your job. If you study also take care of your studies. You, there is time for everything. You can be a serious person and you can be a fun person. If you really want to, to dedicate your life as a, as a science communicator, that takes time and, and, and preparation. So if you want to really live out of that, you have to prepare yourself for that. So I have my community of academics, let's say in these other platforms, but something very interesting is that in these um, platforms, I'm not doing anything related with science communication. It's just a professional uh, network while here I'm doing a lot of science communication. Uh, very quickly, what I'm doing now, unfortunately my time at university finished, but I didn't stop my activities as a science communicator, of course. So I have, um, <clears throat> I also, I'm very close to 1000. It's very sad because when I started 10 years ago, I had 14,000 followers on YouTube, but then I stopped for, uh, for five, six years. And then, of course, the start again is very hard. And now, if I focus only in academia, it's, it's boring for most people. So I try to combine also in YouTube, and I'm growing faster now. I'm also very close to 1,000. And then I hope I can also make some money in the future. I'm still posting videos related with academia, hobbies, 
but for example here uh, social media is very strange so you dedicate a lot of time making very well edited videos and you get 4, 000, uh, 3, 000, sorry 300 views for example of course not many people are working with the same topic i'm working but if i put a video in where i'm cooking with bananas you can see 13000 views so it's very that's why my advice of course you can do your own idea but my advice is always to mix because the people who go to see that video in which I'm cooking, they will receive the next video, which is a video related with the serious problem in bananas. On Instagram, I have what is what I call small little creative projects. So <clears throat> my advice here is if you have Twitter, Instagram or wherever, please start now creating your own hashtags. That is kind of branding yourself and that puts you in the map. On Mondays, for example, I have the Monday insects. In Mondays, I'm teaching entomology. I'm teaching about insects with games, with nice pictures. And why is important to use uh, your own hashtags? Because when people find these kind of pictures in the web, they see the tag. And then if they want more information, they Google. And the only thing that they will see is all your pictures. So that's important for you if you are a good photographer, for example. Other thing that I'm doing is posting my socks. You will say that's a very stupid thing, right? But it's not. This is one of my most popular tag uh, posts. I do it on Mondays also sometimes. And what I do is I post socks, but I'm teaching uh, about the topic of the socks. For example, here I'm teaching something about cherries, teaching something about um, cheese, uh, about uh, um, chilies, etc. What is the important thing here? I haven't had to buy socks since like four years ago. I get socks for free, which I love because I'm a sock addict and that's why I started to do this. Um, the most recent thing, remember the Insta friends that I was doing, of course, because of the COVID, I cannot meet people anymore. So what I decided is to, to make this coffee break with Banana Man. So I gave the opportunity to other scientists, other Instagrammers, it doesn't matter if they are scientists or artists, or food lovers or wherever, I just give them the chance to show their, their work. And we have a kind of interview for 30 minutes and that gives them more followers. Regarding my drawings, as, um, as was mentioned before, I'm also following exactly the same strategy. Fun in this side, because I want to have uh, also my own thing, right? My, my hobbies. So that's why I'm a content creator. If I would decide to be just a science communicator, people don't allow me to do these kind of things because I'm already um, limited to certain things. But of course, I'm also doing science. I'm writing uh, or drawing this comic about the story of the banana in which I'm using really uh, scientific facts to teach about people about bananas. My tip here is to create your own material, don't copy. Um, it doesn't matter if you are not artist or if you are not good at this, there are hundreds of free options that you can use, combine and create. So I don't know if, if I have a few more minutes. Yeah, you, you have five okay. more minutes that you can take. Okay. So of course there are pros, there are cons, but I will focus only in the good things. The good things you get attention for yourself, for your research. As I mentioned before, you put yourself in the map. People know who you are, what you do why it's important. You can teach, and at least for me, that's something I really like. I really like teaching. I, I do it even with my socks, as you notice. So I teach and learn because when you are preparing science communication, you need to ask, you need to study, you need to do your own research, or you need to contact people who knows more than you for certain topics. So you learn a lot. You help others, which is very nice. Uh, your network grows in, uh, immediately most importantly for me i enjoy what i what i do and of course this is a very important topic you can make money i'm not making a lot of money but i for some of my posts i am um, sponsored because i have many followers and as long as it's not something crucial let's say or or something but uh, i just do it so um, essentially 
things related with bananas is, is a nice topic. Um, as Kelly mentioned also, is daily I receive a lot of invitations for interviews, for workshops, how to use uh, Instagram, how to use YouTube, uh, a lot of postcards um, inviting me. So it's nice because you become an expert in your field. And it's interesting because I, I can say that half of the requests I got uh, are for science and the other half for things like uh, like the socks, the insects, the, um, the movies, the, the cartoon, this kind of thing. So it's a very good combination because I'm combining my work with my hobbies, which I like. So just to finalize, uh, thank you very much for your attention and please keep creating. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was a really, really nice presentation with a lot of great information. Like you mentioned, yeah, I didn't think I was ever going to sit in front of a computer and stare into Zoom and do webinars a, last, a year ago. And the pandemic started and I was like, well, we need to find some way to share students, give students resources, have them tell their story. So I was like, okay, gotcha. I'll, I'll kind of work around and get over my anxiety as to getting myself recorded and then slowly started like I still remember the first one I was like I was holding my breath for so long I didn't know I was going to speak at some point so you know it was really nervous but it slowly got started getting used to it but this is more easier for me than to socialize in like a you know meeting and other settings I, I know I seem like a really big extrovert. I know none of the people in the student section will believe me if I tell them that I'm kind of an introvert as well. But when like really large gatherings where I know nobody, I'm probably not gonna be the first person who's gonna go say, hi, this is me, give me a talk. Yeah. That's probably not gonna happen. So, <laughs> all right, thank you so much for sharing. And yeah, so, and that is really a great way like to mix things up. And I, and I love the memes that you put out, the content that you put out that, that also shares the science at the same time is fun. And which I think is the key is to reach a larger audience beyond your niche. Because like you mentioned, if you put graphs, if you, if you put just, you know, figures from your papers, um, people who are going to read that are only going to be the people that who are going to cite your paper or who actually work okay. and understand what that means. So to be able to create content that reaches a much larger audience is really, it's, it's really an incredible work you're doing. Eli, so now let's move on to a couple of questions I have like to follow up about your journeys and then we'll, and in the meantime, and everybody in the audience who has questions for our speakers, feel free to put it in the chat. And as soon as I'm done with my couple of questions, then we can move on to our Q&A. So Eli, you can unmute yourself. Um, the first question goes to you. Um, so, so you started your YouTube channel, you're fairly new at all of these, um, you know, SciComm stuff. You also use Instagram to, you know, promote your YouTube content. How has your journey been there? Well, oh, sorry, my dog is barking right now, but <laughs> I think it's really interesting that each social media platform has such a different approach in what you actually put out and what actually works. And like I, I've told you in the past few weeks, I actually deleted my Instagram and a few other of the major social media platforms just because it's a really, it can be really rough <laughs> comparing yourself to everyone else and uh, feeling like you constantly need to, to prove something to someone. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm really drawn to YouTube right now is because YouTube is very focused on providing valuable content and something that someone's going out of their way to search and find and actually gain value from from watching it for more than just a few seconds and um, instagram i uh, find that the most i mean i haven't experimented too much with um, science communication on youtube just from my undergrad and doing my honors thesis but I found that my most successful posts were ended up being either achievements that I had or um, really cool pictures I had of like a whale shark or a sea turtle or me with a shark or something like that. And um, I think it's, it's interesting that different kind of 
um, response that you get from, I feel like there's more of a focus on entertainment and short term things on Instagram. But again, I haven't done too much um, science communication as extensive as um, Dr. Bastidas. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that answers my question. And also you brought up a really important point and another point why I don't use um, Instagram or other forms of social media for myself. Twitter is the only platform that I now use to like share my experience, you know, grad school applications and other resources. But, you know, Twitter is like the only place I feel like I wouldn't, I, there's a big supportive community and that's the academic community. And that's the only platform I felt really comfortable to use because Instagram, while you have a really large platform or through any other social media, there's definitely gonna be people who disagree with you, who don't like you. And you're all constantly gonna be comparing yourself with everybody else like you mentioned. And that's not a fun experience. I don't think it ever will be. So um, Dr. Uh, Garcia Basile, so you also mentioned that, you know, at a certain point, you kind of fell away from like SciComm because you didn't feel like it would be encouraged within your field. Can you tell me a yeah. little bit more about what that experience was and was it because of your academic yeah. community? Like people asked you to focus more on your research or what was that experience like? Yeah, that's a, uh, it's a very bad experience actually because um, you know, uh, Colombia is a very conservative country, uh, not as open as the Netherlands for these kind of things. And even though I, I had a lot of success on my YouTube channel, I was it was a job for me. Um, pe people started to say think the bad comments like for example, ah, so you are just dedicated to BS and not working, something like that. And that was very painful for me. Um, that people were instead of say, oh, hey, you are doing a very great job, nice videos or whatever, it's like, hey, you're not working enough in, in what you should be working. So that's why at, at some point I just uh, was very in a bad mood that day and I decided to stop uh, doing uh, videos and to actually I delete my videos, which, which is very stupid because it's something that I will regret my whole life because I was making money with as as, as he mentioned, uh, every video can stay there for years, making money for you without you without doing nothing. So I deleted my videos because I was ashamed that people see what I was doing there when th when people thought that I was a, a serious researcher because I was doing fun and things in YouTube, but in the other parallel life, I was a very serious researcher. And of course, I'm talking about ten years ago when everything was different, uh, people didn't really appreciate creativity. And, and essentially that was the reason why I stopped it. So because I continued working in that company, but then I decided to do a PhD. So I came to the Netherlands and then I re decided to reactivate everything again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and thanks so much for sharing. And that's important to note. And another thing is that while yes, you're definitely gonna have people that disagree with you. Another thing to note as scientists and academics, and I know a lot of you in the audience are gonna be students, don't like you mentioned like a pro tip, don't mention your like, um, I mean, don't like ignore your research and like focus solely yeah. on this, have a good balance because you obviously have different priorities. And that's so important as an academic, like I can't sit and create content like every day or every week, um, I can dedicate some time for it. But for me, my focus is my research, writing papers, you know, people have different focuses. And of course, uh, uh, Fernando, you do it as a business. So you dedicate time for it. You have a certain amount of time that you can dedicate. So unless you fall into that category and you wanna use social media and be a science communicator, of course you can, but make sure you know yeah. where, where the balance is because it's so easy to get into the poll. Like sometimes I find myself staring at Twitter for like hours not a good thing. I would not advise that. So, you know, have a good balance and that's usually the way to go. All right. Let's see if we can get any questions. Oh, Eli, did you have anything to add to that? I was just gonna, just gonna say, I think he's touching on one of the most difficult parts of being a creator is really putting yourself out there. And I think when you start to get some negative results or negative feedback, it becomes so important to remember why you're actually posting something, why you're actually putting it up. If it's just for a click, if it's just for a like, then 
you're really not going to have any long-term satisfaction from that. I think it's really important um, to have a life outside of social media and not just be posting things just for following and gaining clout. I talk about that in a little bit um, in my next presentation about how to use social media, um, but it's so important to not just be posting things just to be a cool, fancy, famous scientist. Like where you have to remember the, the reason why you're doing it. You're the science and scientist first and foremost and science communicator um, first and foremost. And um, when you really start to get all caught up in the, the glitz and glamor or whatever of being an influencer, I feel like it becomes much easier to either do something that'll embarrass yourself or do something you're gonna regret. Yeah, and that's true. And on another note that, that uh, Fernando, you mentioned that um, you know you come, you came from a very conservative country where science communication was not that much appreciated. Same thing with me. Like when I started doing all these webinars, started putting it on Facebook, where like most of my family and friends from India are. They didn't understand why I was doing it because obviously that it wasn't something that I was doing for views or for following for my, myself because they, they all go yeah. through the student section so they didn't understand why I was spending so much time sitting in front of a camera, you know, sharing all these experiences and having students highlighted they didn't get why I was doing that. Um, but again, and it was like difficult for me to understand why they wouldn't get it but then I was like oh. Well, it's a cultural difference. I need to accept that. And it took a while because sometimes my family also said the same thing. So I was like, why am I even doing this? What's the purpose? I wanted to do it because I wanted to give students a platform and speakers a platform, share about share resources and other things. But it's so easy to lose what your focus is. So comments like that are gonna hurt. But you know, always like like you mentioned, reaching out to other people who do the same thing probably have gotten the similar comments like you have and kind of forming that that kind of group um, talks may help you get through that and then follow through. For me, it was always people who are super supportive, like the student section has been super supportive of all the webinars and all the stuff that I do. So hearing them tell me that is really what's like, okay, there is there is a need for this. There is This is wanted by people. So then I can keep doing this, doing what I do. So yeah, so that honestly ends my part, my questions. So I will ask now the audience to put any questions they have in the chat. And we'll start going through them one by one. In the meantime, so Fernando and Eli, if you guys can put your um, social media and your you know YouTube channel, Eli, and whatever you want in the chat so that people can see it and they can click on it and they can have it. So that just so that we can have that set up. I wanted to make sure I said that in the beginning, but eh, everybody's still here for the Q&A. So let's just have you guys go and put your all of your links in the chat and also um, Fernando and Eli, if I can get your presentations after the session, I know this is being recorded, but if people have the presentation and if there are slides you might have skipped, I can definitely post them on our website so that people can kind of have this as a permanent resource. So the entire point of the symposium is to create like forever content. Like this is going to be posted on our YouTube channel. It's going to be there forever. And this is something that ESA, the Ecology Society of America, is wanting to incorporate into their career central. So it's going to be like this big database where all things career and all things science is going to be put on there that what we do so I just want to make sure if you guys can share that I will definitely be able to put that on the website now so I haven't had any questions in chat so far let me know if I miss anything but yeah so this was a really great talk um yeah so, <laughs> so you, if any any platform like your website your um LinkedIn your other things um, yeah, so while we're waiting for questions, we also have two other sessions today. Uh, one that's going to be right after this. Um, well, we are actually only hour in the 10 minutes. Um, but um, so we are going to have a next session, which is using social media as a scientist. Eli is going to be talking about YouTube. We have Tyus who's going to be talking about how to use Twitter as a, uh, as a social media platform as a scientist. And then I'm going to be talking about how to use LinkedIn network to share your science and how to best engage your niche community and again i always like to say this like you mentioned there are two different things digital content creator and then science communicator science communicators 
typically tend to reach a very niche audience regarding their academic disciplines or related disciplines. So it's really not about follower count there. It's about how you share your science and make it accessible to the people who are within your community. And if you can make it accessible to everybody, it's even better. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the logistics of that. And um, yeah, so we do have one question. All right. So have either of you considered a career solely focused on science communication instead of staying in academia? If so, what factors affected that decision? I'm going to go with Fernando first. Yeah, um, it's a very difficult question because I, I really love science. I, I, I miss lab, the greenhouse, the presentations, everything. I, I, I feel that I'm a, a real scientist. But of course, going to the other side is also very tempting because it's, it's something that I also like. I really enjoy creating uh, content for uh, YouTube or for Instagram. I really like to do it in a, in a professional way. And that's also nice. So I, I, will, I think I, I will consider to do it in the future. So if I can work for a journal, for example, or for a TV show, or something like that, I will be happy to do it. But for now, I'm still enjoying doing research in bananas. Yeah, you work on a very fascinating subject. Um, I love bananas. I'm from India. Like we eat like every single part of the plant, and we have so many different recipes that we use. Honestly, I always want to like share like recipes and chat with you about it. Oh, well, that's for a later conversation. So, Eli, <laughs> what's your response to that? I think it's still pretty early for me to tell, since I'm still freshly graduated from a bachelor's. But um, I intend on at this point going for a PhD still just because I'd love to have I'd love to be as involved as I can in science and I believe that as a science communicator I feel like I wouldn't have as much authority in that space if I didn't have um, some level of expertise as a scientist first and foremost before I am a communicator and the other thing that has been really interesting um, kind of in this whole year where I haven't really been doing research or as a scientist is I don't really, I, I can go out of my way to go and find research to talk about on my um, YouTube channel, but it's really hard to be a science communicator when I'm not necessarily doing as much science myself. So that's why my channel has kind of evolved into a lot of career development kinds of things because that's what I'm specifically focusing on and um, working on at the moment. I think in the future, I don't know. <laughs> it's so early to tell, but I feel like the best kind of science communicators are and the people that are going to do it most effectively and have the most understanding are going to be scientists first and foremost, or at least have some extensive experience as a scientist. I feel like there can be a, a bit of a disconnect in the science communication world if you start talking a lot about things that you haven't had a lot of experience in yourself. That's a, a very good point. And I know you just graduated, so you still have a long way to go to, you know, publish papers and other things and, you know, but again, but uh, thank you for that question. And thank you both of you for your response. And we're about nearing the end of the session. Um, it was really useful. Again, this is going to be posted on YouTube, so it's going to be there forever. Um, and so this is some great content that you've given us and also great advice. Um, I personally plan to take a lot of those advice. I want to become a science communicator, like at least dedicate like a particular thing. So I'm going to start my PhD in the fall. So I plan on documenting my journey what happens in the lab, what I do, and what exactly it is, because there's so much disconnect, especially. I don't see a lot of content focused on international students doing PhDs. So for me, that's a particular thing that I want to share so that other people who are in similar situations as I am kind of get the feel as to how this is before they even go into one. So, but, so I got a lot of tips from both of your conversations for me to see what I want to do. 
um, and what I want to move forward with. So thank you so much for everyone that attended the session and everyone who will be watching this as a YouTube video in the future. And we will now move on to our second session. And you guys should already have the link since you signed up. And also another thing that before I forget is that we still have slots available on Thursday for our mock interviews and presentations. We have a lot of people, experienced people with giving mock interviews and presentations. And those are free to sign up. If you want experience doing virtual interviews or presentations, please sign up for those. Again, those, all those links will be on our website. I think all of you have those as well. So thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Fernando and Eli for joining us here. Eli is gonna be jumping right into the next session. So thank you so much and see you guys later. Um, yeah, so see you. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Bye, okay.